want me to say, first of all, a welcome to all of you again, and to those of you who are watching this online uh, over at our Mill Creek campus, our brothers and sisters at Mill Creek, welcome. We're glad you're with us. When I was a kid, I was always in trouble for doodling in class, and I thought, you know, it's time to put that to good use. From time to time, I'll draw, and I hope that's helpful to you. It will be helpful to me. It keeps me on task anyway. Let me ask you a question. What do you think of when you hear the phrase, born again? What comes into your mind when you hear born again? Maybe some of you think about Chuck Colson's book biography, autobiography by that title, his spiritual journey to faith in Christ called Born Again. Maybe some of you think about an overly emotional Christian or one who kind of has a radical testimony where they were in, you know, really wild living and has a, had a radical conversion to faith in Christ. I think more recently the term evangelical has been substituted for a born again Christian in our culture and evangelicalism is going through its own kind of identity crisis, isn't it, since the 2016 election. But who coined the phrase? Where did the phrase born again come from? Who, who, who coined that phrase? Anybody know? Yes, if you say Jesus, you got a better than 50% chance of being right in church. So <laughs> that's right, Jesus. Jesus coined the phrase. In John chapter 3, talking to a man named Nicodemus, he tells him, you must be born again. And then he goes on to say that you must be born of the Spirit. And that's exactly what we want to talk about, that conversation, that encounter between Jesus and this man named Nicodemus and what it means, really, to be born again. But to understand what Jesus is saying when he talks about being born again and born of the Spirit, we're going to have to go back a bit in the biblical story and trace out how the Spirit is kind of understood throughout the, the biblical narrative. And that's what the whiteboard here is for. Who remembers what the word in the Old Testament is for spirit? A couple weeks ago we talked about this. We launched this series. Anybody remember that word? Ruach. Right. Say it with me. Ruach. No, no, you got it at the end. Ruach. Yeah, yeah, if, you're, if something coughs up, that's good Hebrew. <laughs> ruach, and the word ruach means wind, breath, or spirit. So it could mean wind, interchangeably breath, or spirit. And we'll use this little symbol here that I'll draw now for spirit throughout this little illustration. Wind, breath, or spirit. That's the Ruach of God. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we read that the Spirit of God, or the Ruach of God, was hovering over the surface of the deep. Right at the beginning, in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, we read about the, the Spirit of God. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Ruach of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then it goes on, Genesis 1 and 2, tell us about creation, how all that was made was made by the Ruach of God. How does God create? God said, right? Spoke, his breath, his voice brings things into existence, the Ruach of God. This idea of hovering, by the way, this interesting phrase, isn't it? Interesting image. Hovering, it's the same image that the Bible writers use of a, of a, a bird hovering over, covering her chicks with her wings. It's the same uh, phrase in Greek used when the angel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Same phrase, same idea, hovering over you. So the first thing we learn about the Spirit of God is the Spirit of God brings order out of chaos because to the Jewish mind, the surface of the deep, the abyss, the chaotic darkness... And then God's spirit, Ruach, comes and brings a garden and beauty and order out of chaos. That's traced all throughout the biblical story. The spirit, Ruach of God, brings order out of chaos. And then we see in chapter 2 that God's Ruach does something else. We see that we are the, he formed man out of the dust, dirt. That's, that's, dirt. that's, that's you and me, by the way before the Ruach of God, okay? That God's breath comes, his Ruach comes, and he breathes the Ruach of life into men, and we become, men and women, become living creatures. Genesis 2, 7 tells us this. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the Ruach of life, and the man became a living creature. So we see right away in the first two chapters that the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God, brings order out of chaos and brings life where there was no life. 
So order out of chaos, beauty out of darkness, and life where there was death or no life. Those are key to understanding what the Spirit does and what Jesus is talking about when we get there. In fact, Job 33, verse 4 tells us, the Ruach of God has made me, and the breath, Ruach of the Almighty, gives me life. And then we read, as we go on, in fact, that idea of the Ruach of God. Take your hand, put it in front of your face for a minute, right up close, and say this, hello. Say, hello, Harry. How, let me see how far I can get you to go with this. <laughs> Did you, did you feel that against your hand? <gasps> what was that? Your breath. That's your ruach. It's not just your physical breath. That's your, <sighs> your life. Right? It's your life. It's a bummer to lose your ruach. You, you, you die. What, what, moms and dads, when you saw your child born for the first time, what do, what do you look for? <gasps> right? Breath, ruach, life into their lungs. The Ruach of God made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. This is central to the biblical idea. Your physical life and your spiritual life comes to you by the Spirit of God, his Ruach. In fact, we see this in Psalm 104. This is a beautiful psalm. Um, tells us about this idea of life. You'll have to forgive this drawing. That's a giant tooth for a baby. Right? That the Ruach of God is what gives life, it creates. In case you're a note taker, Psalm 104. In fact, I would encourage you, if you have some time, it's beautiful outside this week, go outside and uh, take your Bible on your phone or in your actual Bible, find one of the local parks, nature preserves, and read Psalm 104. It'll be a transcendent experience. It's, it's powerful. Here's part of that psalm right here. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their ruach, their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, ruach, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So to have ruach is from God, life, and if he takes it away, you don't have ruach, you die. So right away we see the Spirit of God brings order out of chaos, beauty out of the darkness, life where there is no life. We only have life because he gave it to us. It's his gift to us. This is, by the way, the central idea and the vision that God gave the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel sees this vision of dry bones a valley full of bones and skulls and so on. It's really kind of a crazy image. And this is an uh, image of, you know, the people of Israel, God's people without his spirit who have rebelled against him. And God says to Ezekiel that he says, speak to the bones, say to them, and I'll give them my breath. I'll animate them. This is a powerful prophecy of Ezekiel. He, basically, God is giving him a metaphor, an image that... Apart from God's spirit, his people have no life. Ezekiel 37, verses 5 and 6, Thus says the Lord, the God, to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath, ruach, into you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. What an image that is, isn't it? Think about that. God is going to animate bones. This is an image for what he does to us spiritually, giving us his life. Breath into you, spirit into you. And this imagery of the sinews and flesh coming on the bones, they become living. You know, that, I think Hollywood could do some cool CG with that. Who saw the Marvel Avengers movie? I think, I'd like to see Ezekiel 37 made into a movie where the bones become flesh, but that's just in my head. He'll put breath into you. He'll put spirit into you. God's spirit is God's breath, is his ruach, it's our source of life from the, your first breath in this world to your last. It's the source of your spiritual life. How many of you remember the day of your birth? <laughs> how, many, how proud you were at coming into the world and your accomplishment? Right? No. It happened to you. It was given to you. And this, by the way, last week, so God's spirit brings order out of chaos, beauty out of darkness, life where there's no life, animates us and gives us the life that we have. This is true individually and collectively. Last week we talked in Acts chapter 2 and Joel chapter 2 about the church, right? That in Acts chapter 2 we read about the 
Spirit of God coming on to the followers of God, and that, they, that, that tongues of fire appeared above them. And that this is Acts 2, is the birth, the new birth, the new life of the church. And this is actually prophesied in the Old Testament prophet Joel. That Joel prophesied this. Joel 2, verse 28 and 29, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men dream dreams. Your young men see visions. Even on my male and female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them, and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What is this? This is the new life, the new birth, the born again, the new thing God is doing called the church. And how does he do this? How does he bring the new thing, the new life of the church into existence? By his Spirit, by his Ruach, giving it to his people. And the Greek word for spirit is not ruach, that's Hebrew. Is the Greek word, anybody know? Pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. It's where we get our English word, uh, like pneumatic, air-powered hammer or drill. So pneuma, wind-powered, air-powered, in other words. Me, can be translated the same way, wind, breath, or spirit. Bringing order, beauty, life out of the darkness. And this is the gospel that Jesus came to preach. Life, vitality, spirit into the world. This is the good news he preached. And so, when Jesus comes on the scene, right, in, in Luke chapter 3 and in Matthew, we see his baptism. What happens at Jesus' baptism? He's, he goes down to the Jordan River to meet with a man named John the Baptist. And he's baptized there by John the Baptist. And above his head, there appears the image of a dove. This is not actually what Jesus looks like. You'll have to forgive me. And he's... The, the dove appears above the head of Jesus as the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And then a voice comes. Do you remember that? The voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. In Luke chapter 3. So you see right there in the Jordan River a picture of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit together. The physical body of the Son, the manifestation of the Spirit as a dove, and the voice of the Father speaking, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is Luke 3. And Jesus... Then in Luke chapter 4, he goes into the synagogue early in his ministry. He picks up the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads from Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah 61, he reads these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and to set the captives free. The Spirit of the Lord, the life-giving, ordering, beauty-creating, animating Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news. What is the good news? Set captives free, good news to the poor. It's the gospel message. It's the central message of the church, the same thing God gave the people in Acts, the power to proclaim in different tongues, you see. The good news of the gospel. Okay, so with all this as a kind of a backdrop, Let's look now at this encounter between Jesus and this man named Nicodemus. When Jesus says, you must be born again. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to John chapter 3. We'll read verses 1 through 13 about this fascinating encounter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel 
and yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This is an incredible story, and it's highly relevant to us today, and I hopefully I'll explain to you why that is. Jesus has this encounter with a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. Now I'm going to draw it for you, Nicodemus, exactly what he looked like in those days. I have it on good authority. So you'll have to bear with me here. It takes a while to draw a Pharisee. You're laughing, but this is an accurate biblical picture of, of what Nicodemus looked like. Well, I don't know what is so funny about this. <laughs> so this is Nicodemus, right? Jesus meets with Nicodemus, the Pharisee. Now, in order to understand what Jesus is saying when he says you must be born again, we, we need to know something about this guy he's talking to. Context is really everything here. So let's talk about who this guy is. Um, when Jesus says you must be born again, the f- Greek phrase is ganao anothen. Ganao, born in Anothen, means again. It can mean again. It can mean uh, um, from above. It can mean anew. It's one of those words that has u- unique dual meanings. And that's not like special Bible stuff. It just, we have that same thing in our, in our culture. Words that we use different ways, right? If I, like I hear the phrase nailed it all the time. Nailed it. If I, you saw a board and there were nails in the board and I told you that I nailed it, you'd go, well, I, I think I know what he means. But if I say, like, I just took a test and I nailed it, you, you would think what? Oh, he did really well. So it, this is the idea. The word anothen can mean a, again, a second time, a new, or from above. It has different kinds of uses. So who is he talking to when he says this? Born anothen. He's talking to Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee. What's a Pharisee? Pharisees were, think, uh, the religious version of the Supreme Court and Jewish, uh, like, uh, in Congress. He's the, they're known for being highly educated, religiously zealous, morally upright. So he's highly educated. He would have had the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, memorized by the time he was 12. He would have had the Tanakh, the Jewish Old Testament, memorized by the time he was 16. He would have spent years studying. And, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was once Saul of Tarsus, was a Pharisee before he became a Christian. He bragged about studying under Gamaliel. They were known for their education. They were Israel's teachers. Jesus even says so. Second, we're told he's a ruler of the Jews. That means he's part of the Jewish high council called the Sanhedrin. Seventy members plus one, the high priest. This, this is the group that's kind of like the Supreme Court, the religious version of it in Israel. So he's highly educated, morally upright, and he has a high position in society. He's a leader, a religious leader in the community. By that virtue, he's also fairly wealthy. He's the upper middle class in that society. So think about that for a minute. Whatever born again anothen means, he's saying it to a guy who's educated, successful, wealthy, respected, moral, religious. I want you to keep that in mind. Whatever it means, it doesn't mean get more religious. This guy already is. And we also know that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Why does he come from it? Any of you watch Nick at night? It's a different thing, but I think it's funny. (laughs) Uh, Why does he come to Jesus at night? Why why not in the daytime? Because Jesus has already gotten himself into hot water with the Sanhedrin, the the Pharisees and the Jews. They've already sort of made a public declaration that we're against this guy. He's a threat to us. They've already kind of taken a stance against him publicly. It's risky professionally for Nicodemus to be seen with Jesus in the daytime, in public. So he comes at night, which tells us a couple things about him. Number one, he, he sincerely wants to talk to Jesus. He's not, he's not uh, attacking him in public. And number two, I think it also tells us that I think Nicodemus is doing what we might call backroom politics here. Now, I'm speculating, but I think it's accurate. In other words, he comes to him and he says, what? We know that you're a good teacher. We know. He calls him teacher. We know. We, we know that you're from God. Nobody could do what you do if you weren't from God. In other words, look, I know that, that, they, that, that my colleagues have kind of come out against you. But you've kind of backed us into a corner here, Jesus. We know you're not a bad guy. Let's talk. I think we can help each other here. Don't make life so difficult. Let's, let's have a discussion. I think that's what's kind of what's going on here. 
Plus, I think Nicodemus wants to know, what does this guy know? But when Jesus addresses him, he's totally confused, isn't he? He does not understand what Jesus is saying. He doesn't get it. So let's go to the story. He still wants to meet with Jesus. He still calls him teacher, but he's confused about the whole situation. So this morally upright, religious, highly educated, well-respected community leader, he's about as good a guy as you could find. Better morally than any of us. Sharp mind. Jesus, when Nicodemus comes to him, doesn't even receive the compliment. Did you catch this? He doesn't even hear the compliment. He didn't say, oh, thank you that you call me a teacher. I am a teacher. Let's talk. He just says to this morally upright, highly educated, well-respected guy, you need a new life. Now think about that. Nicodemus says, we know that you're from God. We know that you're doing amazing things. So let's talk. And Jesus goes, uh, you, like, you, you, you need a whole new life. The, 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 the hubris of this on a human level is shocking, really. The audacity. You need a do-over, Nicodemus. Your whole life needs to start over. Now, he's not calling him to get more religious because he already was extremely religious. He's not calling him to get moral because he already was very moral. He's not calling him for more education or information. He was already highly educated. He's not saying, get your life together, Nicodemus. We tend to think about born again, right, as somebody who was really messed up and then they have this experience where they're born again. Nicodemus, his life is on, by any measure of human standards, well put together. I think one thing you should take away from this is this. If Jesus calls Nicodemus to be born again, then it applies to everybody. If this guy needs to a new start and be born again, then everyone does. He just goes right for the jugular. You need a new life. Nicodemus in verse 4 is not dense. When Nicodemus says, born again, how can a grown man go back in the womb? I sometimes have thought of Nicodemus maybe like he was, like he's getting old and senile maybe, kind of confused, doesn't get it. I don't think so. I think he's being sarcastic. I think he's saying, Jesus, I came here to have a discussion, and you're talking nonsense. I came here to like have an open dialogue with you, uh, and you're talking about born again. What does this even mean? Now remember the dual meanings. It could be again, anew, or from above. So Nicodemus zeroes in on again. He's not, even, he's not even getting it, what Jesus is saying, right? He's clueless. So let's, let, we got to put Jesus in the conversation. I know it's always dangerous to draw Jesus, but... And last time I drew him, he had a too big of a nose. Forgive me for that, Jesus. So Jesus is talking to him, and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, and Nicodemus doesn't get it. He says, what are you even talking about, Jesus? And so Jesus uses a different analogy then in the story. We'll put Jesus pointing at him here. That's not very good, Jesus, but we'll live with it. Let's go back to the story. Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now this is fascinating. So I think, what, what's going on here? Sp scholars have debated this. What does Jesus mean by water and spirit? Whatever born anothen means, born again means, it also has to do with being born of water and spirit. Some have speculated, well, that's baptism he's talking about. Born of water, baptism. Perhaps. And there's always layers of meaning with Jesus. Some have said, well, this is physical birth. Water is physical birth. I don't want to gross you out, but there's liquid involved when a baby's born. And then, then spirit is spiritual birth. Perhaps. Again, layers of meaning. But I think Jesus is doing something else. Remember who this guy is. He's a religious teacher, highly educated in the Old Testament scriptures. When he says water and spirit, I think he's making direct references to Old Testament prophets that Nicodemus would know. He said, you're not getting born again, Anothen? It's water and spirit, Nicodemus. In Isaiah 44, the prophet says that he will pour water on the dry ground on thirsty souls. And then in Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 25, this is before the vision of the dry bones. Listen to what the prophet says. God's speaking to the prophet. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. 
and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is fascinating to me. Nicodemus, your life has been a false start up to this point. Everything that you built your identity and sense of self on and your justification before God is not enough, not even close. In fact, it needs to be torn down and you need a new life. He's not saying you need an additive. He doesn't say, Nicodemus, I can see that you're a good guy, but you have a couple issues. You got some anger issues and you're a little inappropriate over here, so let's, let's just work on this. He says, you need a new life. Nicodemus goes, what? Huh? And Jesus says, water and spirit. Did you hear what Ezekiel the prophet says? Water to wash you, wash you, cleanse you, like wash your heart. Forgiveness, grace. Which of you wouldn't want, if, there was, if it was possible, somehow to wash your past clean? To just wash it away. All the things you're ashamed of, you carry around, you hope nobody knows, or you carry bitterness and anger that happened to you. All the stuff, the burdens, the baggage, we've all got baggage. Who wouldn't want that washed away? This is what Jesus says, born of water, to wash you, clean you, forgive you, wipe it off. And the Spirit, why? Because if you don't have that, what happens? You're going to need to be washed again, right? Remember when, when Peter is with Jesus at the Last Supper, and Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, he's going to wash his feet. Peter goes, no, 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 not me. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And Jesus says, well, give me a bath. He doesn't say that, but it's kind of the point, right? Wash me all then. And Jesus says, you're already clean because I've already spoken to you. Here's the point. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, water to forgive. It's a symbol of forgiveness, cleansing. And spirit for new life, new power, to walk in my statutes, to live differently than you would. What good is forgiveness if you just have to keep forgiven and forgiven and forgiven and forgiven because you can never get enough? Water and spirit, he says. This is why Jesus says to Nicodemus, do not marvel that I've said to you, you must be born again. You should know this, in other words. How are you not getting this, he's saying. This is, so, this is the essence, by the way, of the Christian life. I, when I was a kid, we had crab apple trees in our front yard. Anybody have crab apple trees? The flowers are beautiful, aren't they? But the apples are, you can't eat them. You can only throw them at your buddies. That's what you can do with crab apples. You can't eat them, right? You can pick them off a tree and whip them at each other. But, you know, when, my favorite apple when I was a kid was the golden delicious apple. Giant ones, big as your head, golden delicious apple. What if I decided, you know, I, we've got this crab apple tree, and I'm tired of crab apples. But I want golden delicious apples. But so I've never really watered this tree. I've never really uh, pruned this tree. I've never cultivated this tree. So I'm going to water and prune and cultivate this tree because then I want to have golden delicious apples. So I water and I prune and I cultivate my crab apple tree, and then come harvest season, what do I get? Crab apples. I know this is a dumb analogy, but it's kind of Jesus' point. You, you can't get golden delicious apples from a crab apple tree. You need a new tree. You need something new, a new source, a new root, a new life, in other words. So Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you don't need something extra to add on to your already moral religious life. You don't need new information. You need a new life. You need a whole new life. Water and spirit to forgive your sin and give you new life. Jesus goes on then to talk about the wind. Do you notice this part? Right after that, he goes, the wind, in verse 8, blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But do you not know, you don't know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, this sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? If you didn't have the context, you'd think, Jesus is, is weird. What is he saying? The wind blows where it wants to, and you can't, you don't know, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. Tom Skilling might disagree and say we can know where the wind's coming from. But the point Jesus is making is this. You can't control it. You can't make it happen. You can't manufacture it. It must come to you. In other words, he's saying this new life, born again, anothen, again from above, is not something that you manufacture or you create or you generate or you acquire by your effort. It comes to you by the ruach of God, the order out of chaos, beauty out of darkness, life where there is no life. It comes to you and into you as a gift. Where did you get your ruach? Your, where did you get it? Did you make it? It, it? it was a gift, wasn't it? Your life is a gift. It's a gift. So it is with your spiritual new life. It's a gift to you. It's not something you acquire. 
or you earn. God doesn't look down and go, this one's really trying hard. I'll give them new life. Nicodemus is as good as it gets on a moral level. And Jesus says, we can't even have this conversation unless you understand the fundamental principle of what it means to be in my kingdom. Your old life needs to go away. You need a new life. It's not something you achieve or acquire. Again, like the day of your birth, it came to you. Jesus is saying you don't make this happen. In fact, he's saying all of your accomplishments, all of your good efforts, all of your good deeds sometimes are the biggest barrier. You know what? As a pastor in the Chicago suburbs, I think one of the biggest barriers to people getting this is most of you, we live in a culture where we think we have to give off this impression we got it together. We're fine. I, I, I have Facebook. I see. And I know that's not your real life, by the way. <laughs> the pictures you post. Because I know it's not mine. We, we, we're, and I think one of the biggest barriers to us is that, that we're doing pretty well. We look around and we're doing okay. Jesus is not a life coach. He's not an add-on. He's not a guru. He's not like an essential oil. With, uh, th- I, there's no oil for everything, right? My wife has oils and she puts them in our room and there's like, I think I'm scared of this little thing she has in the corner of our room that like glows different colors and shoots mist in the air. I think it's like a witch's cauldron. Anyway. <laughs> So if you're, if you're in essential oils, I think they're great. Don't, don't, email, don't email me. Please don't email me. I, I'm, oils are fine. My point is Jesus is not like that. He's not an additive to make your life better, to help you get over something, to heal you or to help you fix something. It's a new life, a radically new life. You don't just need Jesus to add on and die your old self and be born again. And in verse 9 and 10, Nicodemus says, essentially, huh? He says, how can this be? How can this be? And then Jesus says, we speak of what we know, doesn't he? He says, we speak of what we know. What does he mean by we? Who's the we? Who's we? Who's he talking about? Remember what Nicodemus said? We know that you're a good teacher. I think he's returning the favor here. We know, we in the Sanhedrin, we know that you're a good guy. Despite what he said publicly. Jesus is saying, well, we know something too. Father, Son, and Spirit. In other words, I come directly from the Trinity. I'm God in the flesh. I dwell in unity with the Father and the Spirit. I know what I'm talking about, Nicodemus. And you won't listen. And you can't hear it. Now, here's the great thing about Nicodemus' story. We don't have time to get into it. But if you flip to the end of the book of John, Nicodemus, with another man named Joseph of Arimathea, goes to Pilate after Jesus' death and asks for the body. That's a public risk for that guy. I think something happens in his heart from this conversation, and it takes all that time till Jesus' death for him to come to understand who Jesus is. This is, by the way, what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 8, when he says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us. He says the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something that just happened once upon a time. It certainly did. It's real history. But he's also saying that that power that raised Jesus from the dead comes into your life, animates your life, gives life to your mortal bodies, he said. I'm going to finish with this this incredible scripture. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What a promise that is. The Ordering out of chaos, bringing beauty out of darkness, bringing life where there is no life, raising Jesus from the dead. That spirit of God comes into your life when you trust in Jesus Christ. Not to help you get by, but to make you new. Born again, anothen, from above. It's the central message of the church. It's what we want to be all about here. And I think some of you are still like Nicodemus in your own way, working hard hoping it's good enough. And Jesus says, you need a new life. You need a new life. And he wants to give it to you. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for this, your word and this ancient story between your son Jesus and this man named Nicodemus, which really is so relevant for us. In so many ways, is right where we are. We thank you 
that it's possible to be washed clean by your grace, to have all our sins scrubbed off, and be given your spirit a new life to begin living the way you've designed us to live. It doesn't make us perfect, but it makes us new. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you for that truth in your name and for your sake. Amen.